Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here, um, still. And uh, yes, I wish you a beautiful good morning. I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, my co-managing partner, Pat, will arrive in a few minutes. We will make this a joint uh, presentation today. We changed the schedule a little bit. So first, we're going to talk about um, how are ICOs actually disrupting the early stage environment? What is an ICO? What about tokenomics? Show you case studies about utility tokens, talk about security tokens. And then afterwards, in the second session, we would like to talk about um, how to launch an ICO. Just very quick who we are. We are um, Iconic Lab. We are a decentralized venture capital club and powered through a global ICO accelerator program. So till date, more than 500 startups apply to our program from all over the world. We do, this, we do the same due diligence as you know from the venture capital space and only choose the best one. Just yesterday we um, admitted our eighth startup. So we are yeah, very deep in that space and are having this kind of conversations with startups um, every day. Um, yeah, very quick. So um, Patrick will join in a, a few minutes. Um, yeah, he, when he left uh, university, he was an auditor at uh, PwC. He audited um, private equity, hedge funds and mutual funds, then joined, uh, came to Germany because he has a German wife um, from the US and then um, worked in the private equity space for a time, joined Deutsche Börse here and afterwards launched his own um, prop tech fund here in Germany. Me, I'm Max, I'm from Heidelberg, so a little bit southwest of Frankfurt. Um, I worked as a business consultant for several years. Afterwards, um, I joined the financial space as well, worked in private equity, venture capital. Then I joined the company builder where we created some fintech platforms. And yeah, today we are doing Iconic Lab. So today, as I said before a little bit, so first I want to talk um, about the disruption itself. So um, really analy analyzing the potential of ICOs in the early stage investment process because Back in the days, I think um, equity investing, or until a few years ago, was like the standard thing in the early stage investment environment. And why are actually ICOs so much changing this environment? Um, then afterwards, I would really like to talk about uh, tokenomics, also make this kind of interactive, because my experience is that a lot of people are confused with what is a token, how should I structure a token to really deliver a value add to the investors later on. Um, then about the future, so what are the issues in this uh, very, very young market and what might the future um, look like. And then in our second session um, later we would talk about how to launch an ICO. Um, maybe just f first to get a little bit of a feeling, what are you expecting <coughs> from um, those sessions for yourself? Any questions you definitely want to have answered afterwards? Yeah? Mm -hmm. your model, uh, in order to launch an ICO. Mm -hmm. That's a very interesting question. We'll definitely c uh, cover later as well. If this answer is not um, answered later, please let me know. All right. Yeah. Okay, really cool. Um, anything else? Mm -hmm. So how to com actually how to combine the on-chain accounting with the off-chain accounting and make like a financial yeah, statement yeah. together? Or what, what, what is state of the art or how you do manage it? So mm -hmm. first of all about the after sale uh, process or after chain. Mm -hmm. after you have done um, um, the, the ICO table and, and so on. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Let's talk about this later. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Would be great. Yeah. Would be interesting valuation made on the of the token and how well you can predict actually the success of an ICO and, and mm -hmm. uh, how you do the pre marketing. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. How you can measure. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting. Very with the ICO, for yeah. Example. Yeah, that's more for the second uh, session later, definitely, but also something Patrick will definitely um, yeah, talk about. Okay, um, I would just like to start uh, with the disruption itself. Um, and I think it's very, very important if we talk about um, ICOs to first understand how venture capital works, because otherwise I think you don't know why it is 
um, so disruptive. So um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this kind of model, but just to lead you very, very quick through it. Um, if you have a venture capital fund, investors are contributing money to it. The VC management, so the manager of the fund, has the control over the investments that are being made. The venture capital fund itself invests into the startups and aims for an exit. That's more or less. An exit could be um, an IPO, so if they um, issue shares, for example. It could be an acquisition, so if a big company just buys the startup or something around those lines. Then they should hopefully make some money with that. The money gets uh, redistributed to the VC fund. 80% goes back to the investors of the gains and 20% goes back to the fund. This is actually how the equity world uh, or the VC world functions today. Um, <clears throat> it's a very interesting model. It's, it's been out there for some decades, so it definitely has proven its um, yeah, validity. Um, but there are some issues to it. Um, first of all, venture capitalists in this case are the gatekeepers. What does this mean? That um, remember a few, let's say five years back or six years back, I think it would have been the smartest decision ever from a VC to invest into blockchain. But no one at that time actually understood blockchain and what really the impact of it would be. Nowadays, since one year or two years, really institutional investors are starting to really get an understanding of what blockchain means for our world, how it is changing the world. Um, but back then, I know so many startups that were founded like four or five years ago in the blockchain space, but they never received funding. Today, they can actually choose which um, VC they want to go to because everyone wants to participate in blockchain. This means um, they are gatekeepers. They are very good in finance, but often not the most progressive tech people, I would say. Then you as an investor have little to no choice over the investments that are being made. What does this mean? Normally with a VC fund, you would um, sign an LPA, a limited partnership agreement. In this, they would say, okay, we can only inver uh, invest into these verticals, in healthcare, in biotech, and in finance, for example. Uh, we can only invest equity, we cannot invest debt, for example. And things like that, you would sign that. And then, based on that, they can make actually every decision they want to in what startup they would invest. And the third part is actually a really, really, really important issue, that you have no liquidity. First of all, you always have to imagine that if you are able to invest into a venture capital fund, you need at least maybe 100,000 euro even for the small funds. So you already yeah, should have been very lucky in your life that you have enough money to invest in such a vehicle. But even if you have so much money and you are a lucky person, then you have no liquidity because things are changing. Maybe you want to buy a house one day, maybe you're planning to marry, maybe you want to buy a new car, but then your money is locked. It's locked away for eight to 12 years um, in a VC fund and then you have no way to actually sell it on the secondary market. There are certain ways in the venture capital space, but it's always um, related to a huge discount. So you can never sell your shares in a VC fund for market value. And, and there's Pat. Sorry, everyone. Plus, the pH went down, unfortunately. Yeah. So even then, you don't have a you don't have a secondary market. Um, you don't have liquidity for the holdings you are having. Then it's quite expensive. I mean, if you look at the fourth bullet point, um, you see that the uh, uh, management fee is always two percent in these funds, and the um, carry or the incentive fee is twenty percent. So it's quite um, expensive actually for investors. Then unclear and subjective valuations of companies. That's actually yeah a little bit funny to stand here as an ICO guy and tell you that VC evaluations are subjective. But actually it's true because it's also, especially in the early stage, only based on assumptions. If you look at a multiple method or if you look at a DCF method, they are completely full of assumptions. The growth rate is an assumption. The, um, yeah, the, re the forecasted revenues are assumptions. The discount rate is an assumption and so on. So it's very, very subjective as well. Um, and I think from an entrepreneur's <coughs> point of view, which is actually the most important thing in this case, because he wants to grow a successful business, it's very painful that it take up to nine months for negotiation. So you sit there, you have your own company, you want to do something, you want to build a, a platform, a product, a project, you want to build a team around it, and you are 
just covered with negotiating deals with a VC. And that takes a lot of time and that's not really um, useful at this stage. Um, yeah, maybe was there anything not clear to the VC model? Any questions left from your side? Was it quite? Yeah? Um, it's, it's a performance fee, exactly. Imagine the fund would make uh, now uh, 100 million in profit, then 20 million goes to the VC management, and 80 million would be distributed to the investors. Exactly, <coughs> it's a performance fee. Yeah, and the management fee is always there. It's always charged independently from succeeding or not succeeding. Everything else clear? Good. So how does an initial coin offering now compares to the VC model? Actually from a technical or from a fundraising mechanism point of view, not at all. It's totally different. It works more like an IPO. An uh, IPO is an ini initial public offering, so when a company issues shares, it's very, very similar to that. With the huge difference that it's not a share that's getting issued, it's a token. And we don't know today, or most of the people don't know what is actually a token. Is it a utility? Is it a security? Basically, it can be everything. We will, be, we will talk about this um, later on. And you don't receive mon your income in or your money in euro or in other fiat currencies. You receive it normally in Ethereum and Bitcoin. And actually, this is enabled through a smart contract. So a smart contract defines if I, from my Ether wallet, um, sends one Ether to a certain address, then a certain amount of tokens would be redistributed to me. This is how this process actually works. So it's much more comparable from a fundraising mechanism point of view to an IPO. But why did I compare it to the venture capital space before? Because it's much, much earlier. The IPO normally happens after you already had a Series A, a Series B, maybe some mezzanine capital, a lot of uh, financing rounds. An ICO normally happens at the seed or Series A stage, so very, very early, when the startup is still really young. And this is why, this, this is why the ICOs are actually disrupting the early stage investment process and not IPOs, in my opinion. And this is how the whole picture then afterwards changes, the early stage investment process. So you can see from an investor point of view, you can now finally choose what startups really to invest in in the early stage investment process. You are not bound to an LPA anymore. You have a liquid market to trade. If you say, okay, I now have these uh, tokens from a certain startup I really like, but now it's um, time to sell it with 3x, you could do that every day on any exchange. Yeah. Pardon? Uh, if you have like a market, yeah. L let's let's say every startup that has a market a market cap bigger than ten million euro, which would include the top five hundred at the moment of the crypto assets, they are liquid. But it's absolutely true. If you are in a very very small cap company, let's say. A company which has like 3 million euro in market cap and maybe a daily trading volume of 100,000 euro. Then this would be definitely an issue. But if you now hold 300,000 euro of the tokens, then of course you can't sell it in one day because the order book, there are not enough uh, bits for that. Did you have market makers in that market as well? As in the it's changing at the moment, but not really, not in this professional sense. But it's changing. A lot of people are also working on investment banks and other making, uh, uh, marketing making activities. Yeah, and one of the beautiful things we're starting to see in the space is that it's very much replicating what we already have in the traditional institutional market, where the quality exchanges, actually regulated exchanges nowadays, are actually building in market making functions within their own ecosystem. And they're doing it through algo trading, HSBC. Um, most ICOs that are at least relatively credible will set aside a certain portion of their own token sell that at a very deep discount uh, to actual market makers themselves within that already listed exchange. And that creates that market making function and gives them the ability to have an order book for people to place those trades. So it's really about doing your own research and making sure that these uh, ICOs, the token sales themselves, are connected to the exchanges and have that ability to have that listing enabled by the time the token sale is finished. That's what I just wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, yeah. So, okay, but basically let's uh, see it from, um, no, not theoretical, but um, compared to the VC space, compared to private equity or infrastructure funds, you have a secondary very liquid market. Um, third of all, is um, you can rebalance your portfolio very cheap and efficiently. So as soon as you say, okay, I want to change my exposure more towards infrastructure projects and to um, decentralized applications, for example, you can rebalance your portfolio in a very cheap and efficient manner. Whereas this in the illiquid markets of venture capital funds, private equity funds whatsoever, is much more difficult. Yeah, I think the caveat here is that it's not true liquidity, exactly to the point that you made, but it still offers a significantly more liquid market than you would have uh, investing through a VC fund or investing in just any traditional startup. That's going to take three, four, five, seven years in most cases to see any return, if anything at all. Worst case scenario in issues like this marketplace, you're able to capture a portion of yep. the capital back, um, assuming that the startup itself is a I think, and I think the last research I read about private equity funds, for example, or the secondary market is that you can sell them normally within um, half a year, but with an average discount of 30%. I don't know if this is also what you've mostly seen. Um, yeah. I, I don't know the research side. Yeah. Yeah, it's the last, it was in the Kaya materials like one year back, so I think. Okay, that's good to know. Is that a reference to the underlying portfolio company or stake in LPA? It's the underlying portfolio. Underlying portfolio. Um, and now from the startup's point of view, I think, I mean, you are here at the crypto startup school today, so I think that's even the more in interesting part today. Um, first of all, it's quick and easy fundraising compared to the process you have with a VC fund, for example, or even with a business angels. Um, secondly, you, or because of that, you can spend more time on business development. And I think that's really important to spend more time on the business itself, on the project, than negotiating uh, certain deals. I think that's one of the beauties in this space. And third of all, you, you are maintaining the control of your startup. Why do I find this? Because a lot of people are criticizing that, actually, because they say, no, um, investors should definitely have to say if they have a stake in the company. I don't necessarily agree there, because I think that the good entrepreneurs and the last decade showed that um, were especially able to move very quick and to have a certain vision if, when they were free and if they still maintained the control. So I think it's very, very important for entrepreneurs to maintain control of the company's strategy. So um, any more questions um, to that? So how actually um, the ICO mechanism is kind of disruptive in the early stage investment process? Because on the big picture, it uh, looks like that. If you see it in, yeah, in terms of uh, financing route, it then looks like this. This is the J-curve. It's a very, very um, yeah, famous graph in the traditional financial world that normally as an entrepreneur, you start running with some money. Maybe you have some angel investors. This could be friends and family. That could be professional angel investors. Afterwards, you have maybe a seed capital uh, fund. Then you have early stage like Series A, Series B financing rounds. Then you get maybe some expansion capital from a crow fund, afterwards mezzanine capital, and then you are leading to an IPO. This is like the life cycle of a financing round. So it's a very complicated process. It's a model that has been evolved over the last um, couple of decades. And actually this process is now accelerating a lot. So now you will still go as an entrepreneur with, with your own money, some kind of bootstrapping. But afterwards you might find uh, or you p most probably have to find someone who gives you seed capital because a prototype in this market now in the ICO market is absolutely needed. It's absolutely crucial for success. And then afterward you can raise an ICO actually to sustain your business long term. So I think this has um, accelerated the whole um, financing um, phase model a lot. Yeah. So this is how um, the markets actually changed from 2016 to 2017. 
Um, I think it's yeah. I think you wouldn't be here if that wouldn't be the ca wasn't the case. So yeah, the market uh, grew a lot in that space. Um, and in 2018, actually, already in the first three months, um, more money was raised than in whole 2017. And actually, the percentage of um, blockchain projects that get funded via an ICO in the meantime is 80%. And this is actually a number I find personally very, very, very interesting because a lot of institutional or professional investors want, want to um, get exposure to the blockchain space. But the problem is that a lot of those blockchain companies are not allowing uh, for equity investments anymore. They say, okay, we are raising an ICO. And this is why, for example, the VCs we have, we have met and we are working with, they changed their LPAs that they could allow for token investments. So in the li limited partnership agreement, I talked about this before, that normally they say only equity or maybe just debt or something around those lines. Now it's also allowed to invest in tokens for them with the new funds they are raising. And that's why I personally believe that more and more professional money will actually enter the space. Because blockchain will shape our future and um, yeah, professional investors want to get exposure to that. Yeah, so maybe, um, yeah, just about everything. So the first chapter, um, is there anything, um, yeah, left? Yeah. So that, well, you don't necessarily have to liquidate a shareholding structure uh, to be able to have a token economic model. So you mean a pro proof? Uh, if you have an already existing company, uh, depending <coughs> on the corporate structure, uh, yes, of course you do. Um, so for instance, some of the larger incumbent players would probably have to go through a shareholding program. They probably have to have uh, signatory approvals to be able to actually do anything like this. But from a pure blockchain layer, uh, that's a that's easy. Mm -hmm. uh, so for instance, you're starting to see a lot of blockchain Every single transaction to the line item that's appropriate. I don't know if everyone knows what ERP is. 
uh, analyze uh, enterprise relationship system. It means that's all we want. SAP. Yeah. 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 Uh, effectively, what SAP Oracle needs to be. And uh, is it possible to connect them together? Like SAP, do they already have like um, yeah, a point where they can connect them to the block to a blockchain? Like actually, like one of our startups just did exactly that. The unit so already possible. Yeah. yeah. So actually, <coughs> you can just define a process in your SA in your ERP system. Okay. Push really a button without knowing any coding language, and blockchain agnostic, it could code the smart contract on um, on Cardano, on Ethereum, or on EOS. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And basically, what's going to happen is everybody at one point in the very near future will be integrating with blockchain, will be integrating with coding. They're just not going to tell us. And once we're able to figure out how we scale that platform, now we have true global scalability that allows for retail to be every individual in the world to transact with coding without having They are all working on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why I, IBM and SAP, they have a whole uh, blockchain department. Or even if you look, for example, at blockchain funds, they always are holding IBM and SAP okay. because they know that this space will be very, very, very important for them. Oh. But I mean, all the time when I have worked somewhere with SAP or when I have connected to them, it was quite obvious that there are always freelancers or systems around it because it's, um, always, it's always communicating with other systems. Yeah, and since you have ABAP as a coding language there, and then other coding langu languages around, it's a, yeah, I think still a huge um, yeah, thing to actually combine those systems, and I think this will not change in the blockchain space. Okay. Because at the end of the day, you still have to integrate it somehow, there has to be some layer in between to connect <coughs> those systems, yeah. especially with ABAP. Uh, and maybe before we get back to uh, Matthew's presentation here, just a general survey of the room. Who is really truly familiar with blockchain technology. Um, so I guess, can we get uh, perhaps a quick explanation of what blockchain is? Uh, so everyone is well positioned, yeah, okay, fantastic. Uh, and everyone is familiar uh, with what I see as a nice token though. Um, yeah. Okay, fantastic, so we, we have that covered. Yeah. Um, that's amazing, good survey. <laughs> um, yeah, so anything um, still related to this stuff? Or should we continue with this beautiful part of tokenomics? So, um, I think you can see a lot of um, different definitions of um, yeah the different token types in Europe or worldwide. But I think this is the one which is uh, yeah. The most famous one, and really, ma which really makes sense. So on the very left, you really have cryptocurrencies, but this is just a very, very, very small portion. So out of the six thousand or seven thousand um, crypto assets we are having, and nowadays, um, for me personally, there are maybe six cryptocurrencies. For me, it's Bitcoin, Litecoin, Dash, Monero, Zcash, Zencash, and not not so much more actually left. And th those are really meant to be a, pay a payment system. So they really want to disrupt the payment system itself. They want to disrupt fiat money, actually. If they will do it, that's another question. I don't believe so. But um, that's what they are aiming for. Then you have utility tokens. And that's, you know, there are some people in the space yeah, walking around giving presentations and they will tell you a utility token is a voucher which is completely, to be honest, completely bullshit because yes, a voucher is also a utility token, that's true, but utility token can be everything, really everything. Um, just to give you an idea, our, um, our own utility token we raise is a club membership. Um, there, are other, um, there are other utility tokens which are access tokens to certain services. There are vouchers, so it can be really more or less everything which has a utility in itself. Then you have, I would jump to the very right, you have the security tokens. It's a very big topic at the moment. Um, security token, it could, be, it could be a preferred share, it could be a debt instrument, it could be a company's bond, it could be an option, it could be a derivative, it could be any financial instrument we are having today, just on a token base. And now I think the discussion we are having in the last weeks and months is that a lot of people are saying utility tokens are useless, they are worthless. 
because they don't have any intrinsic value, no value that you can calculate, actually. I mean, with a share, you can really easily um, calculate its value based on the dividend they are distributing. With a bond, it's um, the same. With an option, you can also calculate um, the price and um, the return it's getting you. But with a utility token, it's really, really hard to do that. So a lot of people are saying today, okay, utility tokens, they will die, and the next wave of ICOs will be security tokens. We actually totally believe the same, but there are also interesting utility models. Because whereas the security part is actually very, very well defined because we are already having these financial instruments in the traditional world, the utility function is still something undiscovered. It's still something where you can really be creative and think about something that really delivers a, v a value add to the user. <coughs> and now I think I'm coming to the end game because for me the end game are really the hybrid tokens where you combine those two things. So for example, having a dividend payout, having a, a buyback clause, and on the other hand, have a great utility which makes this instrument even more attractive for investors. Are there questions about these differences or maybe do you not agree with something I just said? Yeah. 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 That's the big issue at the moment, but um, you have to imagine one thing. All the crypto exchanges you are seeing out there, are, they are not professional. Not at all. They don't have the license to actually trade securities. We have some regulated utility token exchanges like the Gibraltar blockchain exchange, for example. Um, but this will change in the future. When professional exchanges are entering that space, if normal exchanges with a proper license will enter that space, then they will be all able to actually trade hybrids securities and all sort of things. Yeah, all the, <coughs> when you look at the exchange places, um, exactly as Max said, most of them are completely unregulated. Uh, a lot of them even have pure decentralization. You have to register your wallet, list on the exchange, you uh, profit on a about OTC basis with your counterparty. If you order books or that, there really needs to be no liquidity whatsoever. Um, what you're starting to see is a more centralized processing system for a lot of the exchanges because they recognize that custody is actually the biggest issue. Uh, that they're currently facing. So once you're starting to recognize this, you're going to see a lot of the more predominant uh, utility token exchanges build in that ability to apply for those licenses. Because the only reason they can't right now is really tied to the custodian uh, level. Now, a lot of predominant exchanges in the traditional markets are currently building out the ability to have a blockchain integration layer for the security token elements. Uh, NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange, local brokers, even here in our own backyard, they're all actively working on this already, uh, simply because this is far too much of an, uh, too large of an asset class and an opportunity that they cannot allow to leave behind. Oh, okay. But what you asked is really, really interesting because no, we're years away from that. We are. We're just just underlying this. It's going to take a long time for the regulators yeah. to truly wrap their minds around this to allow for security token exchanges to occur. The one that's probably the most bullish on this is uh, Gibraltar. Uh, the reason is because uh, GSX, the Gibraltar Stock Exchange, uh, they launched GBX, for those not familiar, it's the Gibraltar Blockchain Exchange. The Gibraltar Blockchain Exchange will allow for uh, utility tokens to transact with one another in a marketplace, they call it, so not an exchange, that's the new term they've come up with. Um, the GSX is actively pushing regulators within Gibraltar to allow for security token uh, issuances within their own platform. So they will do everything from the underwriting of the instrument to the distribution to the secondary level exchange. And that's probably what you're going to see uh, be the future of the place, uh, simply because Gibraltar has that CLT framework that they've had the regulators previously define what they're going to see as a security versus what they're going to see as a utility instrument. And until that comes to fruition in the EU, which is basically going to happen very anytime soon, uh, you're not going to be able to see that on a uh, European exchange. So Luxembourg, I would be surprised if they did, and even if they did so, it wouldn't be that for them. Um, and Liechtenstein, they're just part of the EA, right? Uh, so Liechtenstein is doing everything right now, it's all back to right? Um, but they will not be able to pass for uh, a lot of that level of liquidity. 
set up for professional investors yeah. where they don't have to worry about that tax liability is not necessarily a concern. Yeah. 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 And but we are to both this cost point. Yeah. 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 So that's the both will actually be able to play a big role. Yeah. I have a question about yield tokens or hybrid tokens. Um, I, I have the feeling that um, as soon as, as we, we have the tokenization and able to, to share our yield with them or exchange them, then they are not useful anymore because like the, they are so water, volatile mm -hmm. that it's not really useful for, for most of the use cases to have it as a payment mm -hmm. um, as currency yeah. for the you are, you are absolutely right. That's why, for example, we are getting a lot of applications from startups which already have an idea of what, of what their token might look like and very, very, very often, and it's already a red flag for me, they say it's in ecosystem payment. And you're totally right there because it's so it's so volatile that actually you would have to change the respective rate to ether or to euro like on an hourly basis, yeah, to actually make your services always the same price. Yeah. That's uh, one hundred percent right. So it uh, like doesn't make sense in my opinion to have for ten thousand platforms ten thousand different currencies. Yeah, but I, I'm I'm like I'm curious if it's even possible to adapt to adapt the price always to to yeah. euro for example. Yeah, there, there are people who are doing that. Yeah. Okay. You have, you have actually two options there because that's an issue a lot of startups are facing. The one is really you are always adapting adapting the rate to the respective euro or dollar amount or something like that, or you work with a dual token model that actually you have a token around that was there for the ICO, which is volatile, which can increase, decrease, and so on, and then it's directly connected to actually a token inside the platform, which is always price stable. Okay. And, and then to add to that, um, so for instance. You see guys all the time with applications for a program that are payment instruments within a two-year ecosystem. I, I don't believe in that business model or that I believe in access. Well, then you have to hold a thousand different tokens for a thousand different vendors that you engage with on a daily basis. I mean, who wants to own a Libra, a Legal, and then all these tokens and go to all these European tokens, right? Um, but what you're going to see occur over time is something that I alluded to a little bit earlier, that we're all going to be interacting with blockchain, at least as we know it. At the end of the day, nobody really cares what protocol layer it is Some of you raised the question before whether ICOs are only a fundraising mechanism for uh, blockchain companies or even without. Ah, you. And I think this is the part where I might want to answer this. So I think uh, nowadays, um, since we are having a lot of utility tokens which are totally dependent on the decentralized character a blockchain offers, I would say no. And all the investors, the potential investors are often blockchain believers. They believe in the positive impact blockchain has on this world. 
But the more we will see security launches, the more we will see traditional and professional investors entering the space, the more it will be a fundraising mechanism, in my opinion, for traditional businesses and other digital businesses in the future. That's what I think how this will evolve over time, because we always said we want to support real world business solutions, which is not only blockchain, there are also different uh, other use cases. And long term, we always thought that, um, yeah, it will not be purely for blockchain companies, a fundraising mechanism. I would I would Germany is actually twofold. So yeah. if you if you burn tokens just for the purpose of um, increasing the supply of tokens, it will be considered a security most likely. But for example, if it's some kind of a voucher, because a voucher is also burned, I give a voucher to someone and then it goes away, right? Then it wouldn't be uh, considered a security. Yeah. Or the exact same thing. And this, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Would yeah. you advise the startups here to actually issue a security token right now in Germany? I mean, when when I hear you. We are, it's super complicated. We, are, we are in a transition period, and I think that's a complicated thing at the moment. So as we said, yes, security, uh, professional investors are more looking for uh, securities. Yeah, and I think a lot of people are saying all utility tokens are scam and stuff like that, no intrinsic value. On the other hand, we don't have really a really um, defined regulatory framework for uh, security tokens at the moment, even though it should be... I mean, if it has a dividend and no voting rights, it should be treated as a preferred share or something like that. So we have these rules already in place. But we have, for example, no exchanges then. Uh, what do you do? So I think at the moment it's very, very difficult. We, just to give you an ex example with our portfolio, for example, with four of our, or six of our companies, we are still um, issuing a utility instrument. And with one, we are exploring the possibility of issuing a security. They're just taking the approach from a marketing and a branding perspective that, oh, a lot of regulators are calling utility tokens securities just because that's effectively what the SEC has done, so we're going to do a security token sale. 
So they're calling it insecurity, but in reality, it's nothing more than a utility token. They're just doing this because it's a great marketing effect that they can have, because people are dumb enough to believe that this is going to be something that uh, provides dividends in the future. Unfortunately, the average individual that is investing from a retail perspective in this space is very ill-informed um, and very naive. It's unfortunate, but that's the reality of why we're seeing these absolutely massive valuations of products that frankly just don't exist. But what you are going to see in the future is security tokens that will be truly profit uh, incentivizing. That's what we're going to be doing with our new upcoming token sale um, probably later this year. And what we're going to framework it in is the new EU legislation that is going to allow for higher levels of crowdfunding for an equity or a security element without having a perspective. So for instance, we do expect, surprisingly, actually, uh, Germany to go to the upper threshold of this. They do. Yeah, exactly. I think they just announced eight it last million. week, yeah? Yeah, um, but, it's, it's not, but it's not law yet. Yeah. It's only... It, yeah, yeah, it still has to be passed in Parliament. So basically, to give uh, background to this, I think the law used to state that it was any EU state can allow for a company, uh, whoever it may be, to fundraise. Uh, in an equity instrument of security without having to issue a formal prospectus, a minimum of 100,000 euro, if I'm correct, uh, up to 1 million euro. Five. Being, it, it was five million. Five. Ah, five million. Um, what is going to happen now is the threshold will move to 1 million being the minimum with 8 million euro being the maximum, and that will be completely passportable throughout the EU as long as you stay within the constraints of those different jurisdictions and you're going to be abiding it's by. It's important to give context about a prospectus, because prospectus for non-financial people yeah. always sounds very like, okay, it's a prospectus. Yeah. So a prospectus is a very, very um, complicated um, yeah, process because you have to, you're subject to a lot of yeah, le legal stuff, um, <coughs> compliance stuff, um, liability. Well, liability and yeah. It's very, very complicated. On, on average, for example, it depends, of course, of what in instrument you are in, um, issuing. But on average, there are also studies to that, that on average it costs a, a company uh, um, 320,000 euro, I think was the last number I've seen. So you get some practical yeah, um, numbers. That is roughly three yeah. That's so it's really. Huh? That's a mini due diligence. Oh, it's regulatory due diligence. Yeah, and, and the prospectus is like this. So. Yeah. Uh, it's very costly for startups to do, which is why a lot of them will do an ICO. Yeah. Uh, so for instance, in the United States, it's roughly about $900,000 uh, mm -hmm. to do a prospectus, mm -hmm. um, which is why a lot of companies will go towards uh, the ICO. But what you're going to see, and we're already seeing it happen, is a lot of the jurisdictions are saying, because of this new revelation of ICOs, we're going to push, uh, rather than being the minimum, which is, for instance, like Germany historically has been, yeah. it will be pushed to the eight million maximum to allow for these security token offerings without a prospectus. But of course, this still has to get signed into law. I wouldn't expect it to until probably the fall or uh, winter. I think year. August. I think August, August is the date yeah. when it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, if you really think about raising up to 8 million euro within the EU, for example, okay. then I think you're perfectly fine doing it already in August. But then there comes the question when are the exchanges? entering the space to allow for security trading. I think Pat said it will take some years. I expect the first exchange to be there end of this year, which will allow for security, but these are just opinions, yeah, because no one knows, because most of them are still in sales mode and they won't release information on that. But I believe that at the end of the year, we will see two or three platforms used, which will allow for security tokens to trade. Um, so I think, yeah, if, if I would personally be in the situation of a startup today, I would really, I also brought to you two case studies about utility tokens because I think utility tokens are much harder to get because securities are quite easy. You have a dividend payout and that's why it has a value. You have maybe a buyback clause, that's why it has a value and stuff like that. But the utility token is, is very, very hard. But today I would, the first thing I would really think is what token model makes sense for me, independently from whether this would be a security or a utility. I would just think about what is the best value add I can give to my investors. And then whatever the outcome is, whether it's security or utility, I would just go with it independently from what the regulatory framework looks at the moment. Because at the end of the day, you, I think your biggest responsibility is towards the investors who are believing in your project. Um, and I think for them, you just have to create the best possible token instrument. That's what I believe in.
security. I mean, I would, I would, uh, until yesterday, I would have given this absolutely. And not in Switzerland, yeah. Switzerland's a completely yeah. different story. Yeah. Um, now, but if you're a Swiss company and you raise in Germany, you're yeah. still going to be subject to German law. Yeah. But until yesterday, I would have given actually the same answer completely. So I would always assume that as soon as a token has a dividend and is 90% utility, it would be a financial instrument. But I talked to some people from um, Buffin and they really said they would go through everything and say if the majority is a utility, it would be considered a utility. And if the majority is a, a security, it would be considered a security. What was for me really, really surprising because I would think as soon as you have one element there which actually makes it look like a security, but maybe this really outweighs also the other points. I don't know. That's, I, I think that's the very, I think, I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think at the end of the day, it will be still, um, yeah, the opinion of the regulator. Uh, we are dependent on the regulator there. Yeah, yeah, because I think, uh, as you said, you cannot calculate it, yeah? Okay, this is now exactly 63% security. That's why do you have to issue two-thirds of a prospectus or something like that, yeah? <laughs> And in, in Switzerland, we are even, just the last comment to that, we are even facing another problem that um, a utility instrument, for example, as long as you cannot utilize it on the platform, would be considered a security. What leads to the fact that you're doing an ICO, you have to um, issue a prospectus because you're doing a security offering, and then afterwards it will be actually a utility and you have to transition this instrument to a utility afterwards, which is also kind of strange. Yeah.
I mean, what you could what you could definitely combine, for example, as Patrick said, um, in the U.S. everything is a security, so you would actually sell to accredited investors uh, through a PPM. So what you could do is raise, for example, eight million euro in the EU. And then additionally, um, raise four, five euro, uh, five million euro through a private uh, placement in the U.S., for example. Sorry, it was just to give an example. If you can do an IPO, for example, can raise eight million in euro yeah. from the professional, uh, from the retail invest investor plus some something from professionals, can you re make the token sale with a maximum that's uh, much higher, and you can split that so that you can raise, for example, in Asia eight more. Eight I don't know. I'm not. I'm not um, familiar enough with the um, Chinese or Asian uh, framework to answer the question correctly. So this was only a question regarding the German. I don't have the, the problem with the European law if I raise yeah. more in, in other countries. As long as so it's only the, the, the age limit, limit is only I for think. Europe. As long as you're compliant in the jurisdiction, right? And then what the untold, another untold secret of ICOs is, is it really doesn't matter which jurisdiction you're issuing from. If you do a German ICO, you can go to Boston, get the approval, and sell your token in Spain. Spain might actually say, oh, you know what? If Boston says it's an utility instrument, we actually think it's a security because of X, Y, and Z. I and know. you can get fined and sued, right? So if you're going to do a German sale, uh, do a uh, Luxembourg sale, raise that 8 million, but sell it in Singapore, you might have triggered something in Singapore that uh, should have been non compliant, should have been illegal, yeah, just based on the functionality, which is why you would probably have to go to Moscow. So if you do the security token sale, you're probably going to have to go to the multiple jurisdictions regulators and at least make them aware and ask what the compliance procedures are. So for instance, the Japanese actually have framework for this. So to do a token sale in Japan, it doesn't matter if you're a utility token, uh, security token, whatever, uh, doesn't matter where the hell you're even from. If you're going to sell any sort of token in Japan, you have to go through their 63-point checklist. And that checklist is a questionnaire that you'll have to fill out <coughs> to get to the regulator and then cross your fingers and hope to God they're going to get back to you in three months and give you an okay or not. Um, yeah, I know that. My question was only the, for the yeah. European part, for these 8 million. I'm still compliant if I uh, sell, for example, in Japan, uh, Japan and uh, regulate that locally. I think we have to see what the actual... So that doesn't affect the European yeah. part, it's these 8 million. Yeah. I, I, no. I understand your question because um, I think if, if it's, it's additional, it's just what I would think, but it's only what I think. If those are additional retail investors, I think it wouldn't be. Um, right to do so, but if it would be additional accredited investors to a private placement, independently from where, then I think it would be okay to go over the 8 million threshold. But this is just my. Yeah, I, I'm, but I thought of retail investors in Japan, for example. Yeah, yeah, but that's what I said. I think, I think they would be counted in. So I think um, you cannot go over the 8 million if you invest. But I just think that. Yeah, yeah? yeah we have to see what the law formally says from parliamentary passage. And the eight million is per year, so you can do yes. that. Yes, you could do a secondary yeah, yeah. secondary yeah. offering the next year. Yeah, I can do it over December to January. Then <laughs> I have sixty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is it coming? Okay. I know. Actually, you could really do that. Is it coming? Yeah. At least it was in, with the last law. I think. Yeah. That's good. Okay. So I would, I would just uh, continue a little bit. Um, so. As I told you before, I think uh, security tokens are actually quite clear from the, yeah, from the point of view or from, yeah, due to the fact that it's already defined in the, tra in the traditional financial space. You n we know how option looks like, we know how a debt instrument looks like, we know how equity looks like. So what I wanted to bring to you, uh, especially today, is about um, two case studies about utility tokens that, in my opinion, deliver an intrinsic value 
even though they are not a financial instrument, because I think that's the art of uh, tokenomics, I would say, really to find something like that. So I would uh, first start with uh, our own token. Our own token, um, the ICNQ, for example. Um, so what does it lead to? So if you hold the token in your wallet and it gets detected, you will be able to invest into hand-selected ICOs for the highest bonus or discount. What does this mean? We had till date uh, 500 applications from crypto and uh, blockchain startups. We chose the best eight ones so far to lead them to an ICO with our own money. Um, and in the end, we will um, offer the highest bonuses in these ICOs only to our investors who hold ICNQ. What automatically means that you are avoiding the op or you, you would face a lot of opportunity costs if you would buy them on the free market. And this difference actually gives the token instrument an intrinsic value, even though it's a utility instrument. Did you understand it? Can you say it again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So if you, um, if you hold our token, the ICNQ, this is just an example for a utility token, which in my opinion delivers an intrinsic value, a value can, you can even calculate theoretically. Not that you buy it. Huh? Not that you buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I will come to, to, uh, to uh, another model later. Um, but if, if the wallet gets detected in your wallet, uh, if the token gets detected in your wallet, um, you would receive the highest bonus or discounts on the startups that we are leading to an ICO. What means on the other side, if you now take the, I don't know, so, let's say 60 cents you're paying per token through our club membership, compared to the one euro you would um, buy on the regular market, you would have a discount of um, a bonus of effectively um, 60 cent, yeah, 80 percent, more or less, yeah. Um, and this is actually the opportunity cost you would face if you would buy them on the um, on the on the free market later on in the public sale. And normally, especially retail investors, don't have the opportunity to buy in with discounts or bonuses because the biggest bonuses are always reserved to Bitcoin whales and uh, huge investors. There's another trend we are seeing in that space that more and more money gets raised, not through retail um, anymore, but through big investors and Bitcoin whales. So how many tokens do I have to have to hold in my wallet? That's a very, <laughs> that's always good. When there are smart people in the room, this uh, question will show up. <laughs> uh, yeah, because otherwise it doesn't make sense whether I hold one token or one million token. So yes, it's pro rata. So for the exclu we have an exclusive pool in all of the ICOs for our token holders. And depending on how much tokens you hold, the percentage, um, you can invest a certain amount into those startups. Yeah, that's actually the idea here. You yeah, choose. yeah, yeah. You choose. It's an option. So it's um, yeah, it's optional. It's forever. So it's also not a voucher. So it's not okay. Now I give a voucher and I can do that. You will have this right forever as long as you hold it, the token. Thank you. 
sure any individual that holds the ICMBC that only they had the ability to participate in the discounts and bonuses associated with the company that directed this program. Now, if you want to actually look at what the valuation of an instrument like this would be, uh, well, actually, perhaps I'll ask some of you. Uh, does anybody have a clue on how you would price an instrument like this? That's, that's actually really simple. Yeah. <laughs> so the price would be um, the present value of the uh, discounted amount, or the discounted present value of all the future bonuses and discounts that you would expect to receive through participating in that platform. So this is an example of how you can use traditional financial practices uh, to value a underlying token instrument, which is why we were excited about the token sale itself, because this works on a very fundamental, recognizable level for traditional investors. Well, fantastic. Do you use like compliance rules in, inside your company with all the token sales, or is that like you know things like you have to go over you know the banks you know shuffle around shares to their employees and? No, no, no. no. Uh, so when you say compliance rules, you mean that we have to make sure that the company is coming through the program and remains compliant? Or no, that 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 you that you for example if, if you go to to maybe to an IPO or to uh, yeah. you know, we, we have a the sector or whatever they have very strict compliance. Rules. How you share information, who can buy the shares, and all that stuff. Oh, of course. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. No, so we, um, the, anybody can buy, so this only works um, uh, with utility tokens uh, because a lot of people, if you were to do a security token issuances through the ICMC club, would have to be excluded. Only the accredited and institutional investors, at least for the time being, would be able to participate just because it's outside the regulatory scope of uh, retail investment into this uh, type of thing. Uh, we make this uh, tradable. Uh, we actually have an Alaska letter from Boston that allows us to say, yes, this actually should be an instrument that is traded. We do agree with you. This is a club membership instrument. Um, but we also do not um, distribute any of the shares or any of the tokens to any individual. It's all done through personal. And the tokens we are receiving, they have a one year lock up period. And what I really love about this space is as soon as this is smart contract enabled, it's really a one year lock up period. There's not even theoretically yeah, a way to true. get rid of it. Yeah. It's more secure than a custodian. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Um, yeah. So for a venture capital fund, you said like you need 100,000. Yeah. Uh, how much would this take? Uh, today, you would need, I mean, our sale is closed, uh, the public one, but you would have needed 630 euro. Okay. That was the minimum investment. So it was always one ESA minimum. And the time we closed the sale, I think ESA was a 630 euro. Yeah, I think when we started the sale, ESA was something around 300, <laughs> and then it went up to like 800. 800, and then, yeah. Like, oh, why can't we buy it at the same time? Yeah, like yeah. So it, because <laughs> we, we decided what a lot of ICOs do to always um, tie it to real world money. We always said one ICQ token will be one euro, and the minimum investment would be uh, one ether. In terms of, there are probably about 20 premium uh, investors of the ICMC token, and there's 20,000 holders of ICMC globally. Premium means so more than 100,000 global. 20 premium and about 20,000 uh, global, uh, and that is the retail. Yeah. And also the beauty about that space, what I also love, if you enter the. Oh no, there's 20 members of what we call the premium membership club. Those that own a minimum of 100,000. Uh, those individuals have uh, direct access rights to the company um, just because they're large certificate holders. Uh, basically, they have the ability to negotiate what they feel is a reasonable uh, discounted bonus on the IC and or the, the sale of that underlying company, which actually helps us price what that should be for the retail market. So those individuals, because they are ultra high net worth, they're institutional, they not only need to justify the investment from from a ticket size perspective. Uh, and this is actually one of the biggest fallacies in the space because when we went in, we said, you know what, everybody just based on how much you hold, it goes pro rata, even to VC. Um, the problem is, is that a lot of institutional investors, they really want to come with a big ticket for a lot of companies. Mm -hmm. And we actually had like, some people that were willing to give us, we were willing to give them 10 million. Uh, we had about three individuals uh, that said, you know what, I want to buy the whole thing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I completely beat my business model that actually doesn't work for me. Because unfortunately what's happening in this space is basically um, it, it's just the way it's the, the bad news around it, especially in an Asian and Middle Eastern market, that they can say, you know, I'd have to buy that whole thing. And then they sell it out in uh, little small pieces that they exclude. Um, so we created 
that premium money gets an alternate opportunity to negotiate for the size of these bond bonuses, which gives us a price discovery when you can then turn around and sell that amount to the retail. I mean, that's how we're going to go. Yeah, I'm going to no, 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 it's not limited. No, 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 no. no. If, if, if we have a total of 20 million tokens outstanding, I think in our sale we burn about 2.8, 2.9 of the total, yeah. so there's about 17 million outstanding in the world. Um, you would have to purchase 100,000 of those 17 million. You then have access to that premium swap uh, to be able to negotiate yeah. the first deal with all the outstanding. I mean, we have, we have to buy some lines and out of the vault. Yeah. So we have Thank you. I think that's a very important thing. I was, I think, yeah. So, um, come, uh, yeah. One last 
question. Um, don't you have an uh, tech is, uh, issue? Because you're we are paying back. Oh yeah. Yeah, we, we, we are utilities, but we are paying back taxes. Yeah, we paid our back. We paid our corporate income taxes. We just had a tax audit recently. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the regulatory <laughs> didn't believe that a startup that just launched last year had a couple million in revenue yeah. the previous year. But um, that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> so we had to get all of our paperwork together. But we got a check of approval. Yeah. The law for compliance is just the easiest thing in the world to do. You just have to know what the rules of the game are. Suit them on. But it's a lot of work. But yeah, it's worth it. Oh, how are you going to And then you're facing a lot of cost per year, and you can actually stretch those um, expenses over more than 50 years if you wanted to. Uh, how much do you take from the startup for the accelerator? Um, two to nine percent. Two to nine. Yeah, it depends on three variables. The one is how much co how much cost you are covering. You are covering up to 300,000 euros. Second variable, how early you are coming, uh, how early you start working with them, because you could start at the tokenomics level and blockchain level, or we could only start from marketing and investor relations is the most important thing. And the third part is the ICO stuff. Do you, do you take the two to nine percent of their equity or no, of the token? Um, in, in t so two to nine percent in their token, so what, of the, what they are issuing, and half of it in Ether directly after the ICO, and the other half in their native token that they have locked up of one year for that. Yeah, we try to do as full crypto with this business model as possible, um, just because a lot of companies now, what we've seen is that it's not necessarily very early stage startups that have good use cases for us. But we're actually the companies that have done the venture financing round, have a working business product that's maybe even gone to market, that can be able to integrate that blockchain and tokenizable layer to the ecosystem that they've already developed. And then we can help market that through our channels, connect them with investors, and then really push their token sales to be compliant, uh, which is actually one of the biggest issues in the space, just because no entrepreneur knows how to navigate this unless they have that. Not in the exclusive one. Yeah. yeah. There might be another public um, pre sale where there is also some discount, but not in the exclusive one. 
I would just, uh, due to time issues, just jump to the next token because the m key message here was actually because we are having this conversation with startups every day. And I think the key question at the moment for them is really often utility or security. The problem is most of or a lot of people are now telling you in that space uh, utility tokens are always worthless. I wanted to show you here one example where utility instrument, which is uh, even uh, Bafin approved a utility instrument, can still deliver an intrinsic value. And I would, uh, I brought another case study to you. Um, it's uh, Steam Power. Who of you is familiar with uh, Steamit? Yeah? So you're well aware because I really like that. And just for the people who are not aware um, how Steam actually works, um, I just wanted to, on a very high level, discuss the Steam Power token itself. So imagine we would, um, you are on a, it's a social media platform, right? So we would be on Facebook. The more I post, the more I comment, the more I share, the more uh, reach I have, and the more I, let's imagine for a second, Facebook would be open source, the more I develop on Facebook, imagine I created the, f um, the thumbs up button or something like that, the more Facebook power I would become. Yeah, meaning that I have more power in the network to actually influence things, to vote things up. My like is more worth than another uh, like. My comment is more worth than another um, comment and so on. And the very interesting thing is now, um, if I, and that, that's in the, steam, in, in, the, in the case of Steemit, that's called Steam Power. So you get more Steam Power on the network, the more you interact, the more value add you're delivering to the website. And now there comes the interesting part, after a certain amount of time you have to wait, you can actually monetize the power that you have. Imagine other people, for example, would like to enter the space, uh, would like to become influencers, want to have power on the network, yeah? Um, then they could just buy in with, uh, real, with uh, Steam Dollars into your Steam Power, and then you could actually monetize the power you're having on the um, platform. And that's always a very, very good example, I think, for if you have some sort of a platform approach that you can actually incentivize the people to uh, bring a lot of value add to your platform and then make this somehow monetizable. And I think that's another good example of how actually a pure utility based model can actually be very, very, um, yeah, deliver an intrinsic value. Yeah. Yeah, any questions to that model? Yeah. Can they, um, if they have money, they can buy steam power without the intermediary? Without the intermediary to other blocks or whatever? So it's, 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 it is more complicated. It is more complicated. But yes, you can buy um, steam power to get more influence on the network. <coughs> but they are like um, cool, no, not cool down, um, heat down period. I think it's called. So you have to, for example, wait. After you earn Steam Power, you really have to wait until you can um, sell all of your Steam Power. And on the other hand, because one of the biggest issues actually Steam it saw is um, that you could now theoretically, an influencer who wants to have a huge impact on the platform, could buy a lot of Steam Power and then have a huge impact on the platform. And to avoid that, there are certain limitations to that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think with that, um, we should maybe have a break and then do later the second session where we first would start with the future of ICOs and uh, what is happening in the futures and what issues we are especially having in the ICO space and then um, how to launch an ICO. Yeah, perfect.